Good morning, KBC. Um, welcome to our uh, Sunday conversation uh, this Sunday. Again, we are live uh, via Facebook, and so we just want to welcome you uh, to our service this morning. And uh, just as people log on, I know I'm a few seconds ahead of everyone, so just as people log on, just want to pass on um, a few announcements uh, just before we get going. Uh, first announcement is, again, just a, a big welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us for yet another uh, online uh, service this morning. And uh, if you're with us and you're new, uh, I just encourage you to please fill out our contact uh, card. And you can find that in the uh, link for this week's video description. So if you're new with us, we just uh, would love a uh, an opportunity to connect with you and just a record of your visit with us. So again, um, you can find the connection card or the contact card um, on our week's uh, description video. Um, also, uh, that you can also find uh, links on uh, the video description for our weekly newsletter. And this is where all the information uh, on the various events that we have going, um, you can find them, uh, things that are coming up. Uh, any of the information that you need to find to get involved in the life of KBC is there. And so I'd encourage you, if you're not currently um, receiving our weekly newsletter, uh, that you go to the link and you sign up so that you uh, don't miss out on anything. Uh, as well, uh, there's also a link there for um, financial giving. And uh, though there were not in person, um, we as a church, we still have... Um, regular expenses that we need to cover and we're just so thankful for God's uh, faithfulness over these last uh, number of months this last year that uh, we are in still uh, we're, we're still meeting our needs um, but we have seen offerings drop a bit um, over uh, from from beginning of this year so uh, just an encouragement that if you are a member of KBC a regular, a regular attender of KBC that uh, if you go to the link and you're not currently giving, you're not currently giving regular, I just encourage you to think and to pray about um, how God might have you um, just support the work of KBC. And there's a number of different options uh, in the link to uh, this video that uh, will allow you to give in a number of different ways. And uh, finally, I want to share some uh, exciting news. Um, the elders would like to announce that uh, we, after uh, many months of searching, it's been about seven months right now, that uh, we have a candidate for our worship director position uh, that we would like to introduce to you uh, next summer. If you remember, um, in, uh, I guess it was September at our annual meeting, um, we had made the decision that uh, we were going to go ahead and uh, look for a part-time worship director, um, Sam has done a fantastic job in filling in, um, but right when he agreed that uh, he would step in uh, to fill the gap, and we knew it was never going to be a long-term um, choice, and, and so we've been looking for a part-time worship director, which has been a little more difficult during COVID, uh, but we're excited to announce that uh, next Sunday, uh, we want to introduce to you um, Emma Clark, and uh, she has um, been around our church a little bit during COVID. Um, I know she's been able to meet um, some of our staff, and uh, she was on with the ladies last night on their Zoom call. Um, but we're excited to be able to introduce you to Emma next Sunday, and she's going to be leading uh, worship for us during our online service as well. You'll have an opportunity to get to know her a bit more as I get the chance to interview her. And uh, so uh, please make sure that you you join us next Sunday for um, this time to get to know Emma. And uh, the details about the process uh, moving forward in the hiring um, were included in this past Friday's newsletter. So please be in prayer for Emma and KBC as we seek to confirm uh, God's leading through these um, final few steps of the process. So again, just some exciting news uh, in the midst of COVID. And I just, again, want to welcome everybody. I see everybody jumping on. So uh, welcome everybody this morning. So glad uh, that you are here and are joining us. And uh, so we're going to jump into our Sunday conversation. 
and uh, we're continuing on in our service, uh, the church defined um, who we are versus who we should be. And uh, so just let me open this time in a word of prayer and then we'll get right into our study. Uh, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for today and uh, we thank you again just for allowing us to gather uh, together as a church. And uh, though online isn't ideal, um, it has been a real blessing uh, during this year of COVID. And so we thank you for the opportunity um, and the technology that allows us to still meet. Normal ministry into regular ministry. Um, faithful in these ways of being able to connect together. And Lord, as we open up your word this morning, as we um, continue our, our series looking at defining the church about who we are um, and who we should be, Lord, I pray that you would just encourage us and challenge us uh, with these words this morning. And uh, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, again, uh, welcome to our uh, Sunday conversation. We are live. And uh, what that means is uh, we want you the opportunity to interact with one another. So if you have uh, you know comments as we go about our study, uh, there's going to be a couple opportunities. I'm going to um, point some questions that I'd love for you to respond to one another. But this is a time that feel free to use the chat box and that we're able to to encourage and challenge each others as we uh, walk through this study this morning. So I want to begin by just kind of recapping. Over, over the last 13 months, um, as Christians, we have been given a unique opportunity um, to have a front row seat into more churches than probably we've ever had the opportunity of uh, viewing before. As large portions of our Sunday services not just us as a church, but uh, really uh, worldwide, have been moved online. Uh, we have access probably to uh, any church, to view any church service that we really would like to. And uh, during this time, we, were, um, we have witnessed how different churches worship, how they communicate, and how they connect with one another. Every week, we have hundreds of different people um, view at least a portion of our online services at KBC. And with each one of those individuals making a judgment call um, on the qualities that they see in KBC. So everybody comes in and they, they look at what we do. They look at our studies, they look at our worship. Uh, they look at maybe how we connect and they make a judgment call on some of the qualities that they see in KBC. Now we all understand that um, this is just a snapshot in time and that what we see online doesn't really give it anywhere close to a complete picture of what a church really is. But very soon we'll be returning to regular in-person ministry. And we as a church are going to begin the process of rebuilding much of what has been set aside as we have had to navigate uh, this pandemic. And part of that rebuilding is to determine as a church, what are the marks um, that are, that are going to mark us going forward? What are the things that we are going to make sure that are uh, marks of us being a healthy church in the days ahead? And so what I want to do is I want to begin by posing a question to you. And uh, this is something that, again, would really appreciate your feedback because we'll kind of go through a few of these uh, in a few moments. But the question I'd love for you to respond is, is this. What are the marks or the characteristics that you deem as vital to the health of KBC moving forward? If you were to look at some identity markers, if you were to look at some things that you would hope and would pray and be excited that would be part of KBC's identity or character 
moving forward, what would those things be? So take some time to, um, to, to write those down and to share those, and we'll come back to those in a few minutes. But the one thing that the pandemic has done um, for us as a church, and, and quite honestly for a lot of churches, is it has wiped the slate clean. We are no longer tied to what we have always done as a church. Uh, our calendar has, for the most part, been cleared. And so we need to decide what we are going to, um, what are going to be the foundational priorities that need to mark um, KBC moving forward. This past fall, um, the elders presented our Vision 2020. And this included our four P's, which would uh, which we would use as a church to kind of inform our activities and priorities moving forward. Uh, the four P's are, are praise, so we wanted to make sure that we have a, a commitment to, um, to participating in worship. Um, partner was our second P, and this is, talks about connection. And, and this is both fellowship, but it's also this deeper connection as a church of, of support and of care. Um, and of, of doing life together. The third P was prepare, and this speaks to our commitment to discipleship and to training, um, to providing opportunities for us as a church to, to grow into our, in our faith, to grow as church members, um, to grow in our ministry, to grow in our, our skill sets and our gifting, and to use those things. And then finally, um, the fourth P was proclaim, which is um, our commitment to have a gospel witness, um, both within our church, um, but also with the communities around us, um, zeroing in on uh, York Region and especially King City. But the health of a church isn't just about what we do, but it really is about, and it starts with who we are, those foundational anchors that we commit ourselves to that mold not only our activities, but even more importantly, they mold our beliefs and our, our identity. So as we transition to this next um, section in our series, The Church Defined, what we're gonna do is over the next nine weeks, we are going to conclude by looking at nine identity markers of a healthy church. Now I've adapted our themes from the book Nine Marks of a Healthy Church by Mark Dever. Uh, he is a pastor in uh, Washington and he has spent much of his ministry career weeding through all that churches do to try and get a biblical um, perspective and, and to find the biblical instruction for who churches ought to be. And his insight is uh, will be a great help as we kind of navigate um, this journey. So I want to begin by talking about this. We live in a Google world. Uh, when we need to find information to solve a problem, to learn how to do something new, what do we do? Well, we Google it. Um, when we need to know the steps to, or sorry, when I, I need to know the steps to winterizing my motorcycle, uh, the very first year that I got it, uh, I had no clue. I didn't know what I needed to do to make sure that the motorcycle was okay for the winter. And so what did I do? Well, I Googled it. Uh, this past week when we were having problems with our furnace and continue to have problems with our furnace, well, I, I Googled it to try to find out if I could figure out what was wrong. When I need to figure out how to cut a weird piece for some uh, tiling I was doing uh, before Christmas, well, I Googled it. When Christy and I were on holidays a week ago, and we wanted to find something different for takeout, well, we Googled it. No matter what the information we wanted to find, um, something, uh, sorry, no matter what the information we are looking for uh, or the problem that we are trying to solve as individuals, uh, there's a good chance that if we Google it, um, we will find some link to the exact information that we need. Now, there's an inherent problem with with our Google world. While Google is convenient in that it is, it can provide us um, quick links and quick information to the answers that we are looking for, uh, the answers Google provides are not always the best. 
Case in point, in trying to fix our apparent problem with our HVAC system. Uh, I found a link to a workaround that included some slight rewiring of my furnace control panel. The guy in the video looked knowledgeable. Um, he actually had a shirt with an HVAC symbol on it. And he spoke with, with confidence and he provided um, through a YouTube video step-by-step -step instructions. And I'm pretty handy and I was thinking about this as a solution and figured, yeah, I could do this. Until another post I, I read stated that uh, if I followed these instructions, it was a good way to burn our house down. Sometimes the easiest way is not always the best way. Which brings us to our focus this morning. There are a number of things that can and should mark a good church, a healthy church. Um, some of the ones that, if I look at that we're, we're um, writing off is, uh, we've had some say that the church is, needs to be a community. So community is a, is a huge thing. It, it's our community as a church in regards to one another, but it's also that the church is a, a pillar in our community. Um, Bible teaching from the Word of God. A friendly people. Um, Janet says that a key thing is is to genuinely have fun together, uh, to enjoy one another, to love one another, uh, to be in f refreshed by one another. Um, <laughs> Ron says barbecues. <laughs> we are a traditional group and with our Baptist roots, uh, we love our food. Um, so there are many different things that when we look at a church that the things that we long for um, the fellowship um, passionate worship uh, discipleship learning and growing together um, our commitment to one another to, to reach the lost um, a place where family members are are friendly and are committed to one another and committed to uh, the church as a whole we want to make sure that we have great kids programs and youth programs and adult programs. And, and these are just a few of the things that I know if we were looking for a church that we would hope would be part of um, the place that we call home and, and hopefully a part of, um, of, of what we long to see at KBC, um, even the food. <laughs> but there's one identity marker that sits at the foundation for every good and healthy church. And I would so, go so far as to say that if this identity marker is missing from a church, um, I would advise you um, that you need to stay, stay clear of that church. So what is this foundational building block of a healthy church? Well, does this, and, and actually John mentioned it um, a little bit before, a healthy church proclaims the word of God. A healthy church proclaims the word of God. I love the, the two letters that Paul wrote to the young pastor, Timothy. Paul's instructions to Timothy have served to provide the church with some of the key principles in, in making sure that the church of Jesus is healthy and is led well. And as Paul concludes his second letter to Timothy, uh, he finishes with these words. And I encourage you, if you have your Bible, to to open them up as I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, um, verses 14 through to chapter 4, verses 5. And I, um, I know someone will jump on and throw that up for me on the chat, so you also have it there as well. But this is what Paul instructs Timothy in these closing words of his second letter. He says this, But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, or scripture, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed, and, um, sorry, all scripture is breathed out, of, out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. And then verse 1 of, of chapter um, 4 says this, I charge you in the presence of God, 
uh, and, of, and of Christ Jesus, who is the judge to the living and to the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and extort um, with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have, um, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So what is Paul saying to Timothy as he kind of draws together some closing thoughts as he really commissions, and we're going to see that in the second part, as he commissions Timothy to, um, to go and to do the work of the ministry. What are Paul's final instructions um, to Timothy really zeroed on? And there's two things I want to mention this morning. And the first one to this is, is Paul is urging or instructing Timothy to remain faithful to God's word. Now, we are a people uh, enamored with anything new. You know, I guess that's what happens in a throwaway society. Um, generations before us or before me, when something was broke, they fixed it. Now we live in a word that if your world that if your toaster goes or some appliance goes, instead of spending the money to try to bring someone in to fix it, we just throw it away and we go to the store and we, we buy replacement. And that's what happens in a throwaway society. We have bought into the idea that new is always better. Let's face it, we all love the feeling of, of driving away from a car dealership in a new car or a new to us car. We love the idea of, of upgrading our phones as soon as a new version comes out, getting a new or bigger TV a new toy or, or whatever else that might draw our attention. And so we ought to sit up a bit and, and take notice when we read these final instructions to Timothy, where Paul says this, he says, continue in what you have learned. Continue in what you have learned. What Paul is saying is that when it comes to being the church, there are some foundational elements that we need to leave as is. Paul isn't telling Timothy, hey, Timothy, you know, as you go about ministry, there's going to be lots of new stuff. And make sure that you jump on the best study or, or, or the new event or, or the new ministry. That's not what Paul is saying. He's saying, Paul, or he's saying, Timothy, there's some things that have been foundational in your life. There's things, some things that have been foundational in my instruction to you. And so you need to take that foundation, the foundation of God's word, and you need to continue in that. And so when we come to the church, that there are foundational elements within the church that while they might take on a different flavor, at their core, they don't need to be set aside. They don't need to be replaced with something new. See, this message is huge to us as believers who, who live in a world with a short attention span, where we seem to easily get bored and we're always looking for the next best new thing. Paul is telling Timothy to, to fight the temptation to always be chasing after the next thing to keep people engaged or entertained. See, as a healthy church, it doesn't mean that we're always on the cutting edge. And to be a healthy church doesn't mean we always need to be on the cutting edge and at the top of the line of, of adapting every new thing. That we can still be a healthy church as long as we have the right foundation in place. So what is that foundation that Paul pleads with Timothy to continue in? Well, of course, it's the word of God as our primary source for the church's instruction. 
Listen again to Paul's words in 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, where he says this, All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof or reprimand, for correction and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. See, the word of God is where we go to in order to hear the voice of God and his direction for us. It is where we learn who God is, what God has done, who we are, and the good news of how God made a way for us as sinners to be restored back to him. It is the place where we learn what it means to please God and how we ought to please God and and how to live for God in a sinful world and to learn what it means or, or what's important in life and the things that aren't. But the word of God is more than just a personal source of instruction, but it is the place where we learn what it means to be the family of God. The word of God contains our marching orders as the church. The word of God gives us our authority for correcting and reprimanding and and, um, instructing one another. The word of God is also our source of encouragement to keep going when we begin to lose hope. So we don't need a fancy building and cutting edge programs to be a healthy church. All we need to be is a healthy, to be a healthy church is to be a church that is obedient to the word of God. This is not to say that facilities and programs are not important, but they can often serve to distract us from what is most important. If what we do isn't directed from God's word, then Really, what we are is nothing more than a social club. And this leads us to the primary responsibility of the church. And this is the second thing I want to mention this morning. It's this. The primary responsibility of the church is to faithfully preach God's word. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 2 says this. I charge you, and again, this is um, Paul's kind of marching orders or commissioning um, to Timothy. And he says this, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead and by his appearing and his kingdom. So he's calling as a witness in these words to God the Father and to Jesus Christ and to all that Jesus Christ will accomplish both in the day to day and in the appearing of his kingdom. So, The witnesses to this charge, you can't go higher than that. And this is what the charge is. Preach the word. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove by using the word to reprove or to correct, to rebuke and to exhort. With complete patience and teaching. See, there are so many things that could have been part of Timothy's pastoral calling that Paul could have rightfully highlighted in his his closing words. He could have talked about caring for the flock. He could have talked about equipping leaders, about supporting the needy, about making sure that a church has great outreach opportunities, great kids programs and youth programs, all of which Paul highlights throughout his other letters. But when given the opportunity to commission this young pastor, above all, he called him to first and to foremost preach the word. So why is that? Why did he set all the other things aside for this singular um, commission or this singular call on Timothy's life? Well, it's because it's within the proclamation of the word of God that the Holy Spirit changes and transforms lives. See, it's within the proclamation of the word of God that the Holy Spirit changes and transforms lives. And so this charge to Timothy is given with a sense of urgency to take every opportunity to call people back to the truths found in the word of God. The importance of this charge takes on an increased importance 
as Paul describes a time when people will willingly walk away from the truth of God's word. And, and in doing so, that they will begin to search for those that will bolster their faulty ways of thinking. And the world will be a place not marked by a desire for truth, but will be marked by a desire for inclusion, for what's popular. And they will do this at the expense of truth. KBC, I don't know if you've noticed the world around us, uh, but we're living in a world like that right now. We're living in a world where the vast majority of people would rather accept the opinions of those on social media rather than the truth of God. That we would look to what is popular rather than looking to what is right. And we will keep searching and keep asking people until we find those that agree with us. Until we find those that will pop up or prop up our own faulty way of thinking. And so Paul implores Timothy to preach as the primary way of communicating the truth of God. But see, all we need to understand this is, is that all preaching is not equal. And when I make that comment, I'm not talking about the skills of the preacher or of the teacher to hold one's attention through the craftiness of words. But we need to understand, and I'm sure if we looked around, that there are, there are many amazing speakers and preachers and communicators out there who do an incredible job at holding one attention, at, at, at entertaining, at communicating um, words, communicating thoughts, communicating ideas. But if we were to really dive into what they were saying, they actually have very little truth to convey. In, in a lot of cases, their words will do far more harm to a person than good because they're not truthful that they are not um they, they don't, they're not they don't find their foundation in in the word of god so what paul is calling on timothy to do is to do this he's saying timothy as you preach you're not preaching ideas you're not preaching your own concepts you're not preaching what you think people need to hear and they're trying to craft something so that they'll pay attention. But what Paul is calling on Timothy to do is through preaching, through teaching, to expose the truth of what God's word is to his listeners. So that when this time of teaching or the sermon is done, that the people that listen to that, not that they walk away and go, wow, I was really entertained. But know that they walk away and they know that they have clearly seen what God is saying to them and what God expects from them. See, the power to transform doesn't lie in the words of a preacher, but in the truth of the words of Scripture as hammered home by the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I can't tell you for me how freeing that is. Because even as a faulty vessel, which I am, I am convinced that as the word of God is proclaimed and its truth is, is exposed, uh, lives will be changed. And every time I have the opportunity to communicate with someone, um, that is my heart, is that lives will be changed. And this, I pray, is the confidence of each one who have, been test, uh, who have been tasked with leading a Bible study, sharing the gospel with a friend, seeking to provide counsel for another person or, or guide another person. I, I pray that our confidence is that if we seek to expose the truth of, of God's word, that transformation isn't dependent on us, but transformation becomes the work of the Spirit as the truth of God takes hold in a person's life. And so my commitment to KBC, as long as I am 
your pastor, is to ensure that we as a church will continue to preach and to teach uh, the word of God with clarity, with conviction, and with purpose. But there is a flip side to these marks of a healthy church that we're going to be working through over the next number of weeks. In that each one resides not just as a commitment of the local church, but each one also has um, an inherent commitment for those who call KBC their church home. Or if you're listening and you belong to another church, whatever church that you call. It's not just the responsibility of the church to communicate truth to you, but it's also that you also have an inherent responsibility in the process as well. So if the foundational mark of a healthy church is to be a church that through its preaching and its teaching seeks to expose the truth of scripture. So what is the corresponding mark of a healthy church member? Well, as a person who attends weekly services, What responsibility lies with you in these times of instruction? Well, in simple terms, it is to make sure that we are in a place to receive the biblical truth proclaimed, that we are prepared to be biblical listeners. Now, I don't imagine for most of us this is an aha moment, but you might be surprised how many people come to church not really ready to listen. So let me ask you um, a question as we um, draw this morning to a uh, a, a conclusion. And the question I want you to answer is this, and again, please use the comment box to to encourage um, one another. And the question is this, what have you found helps you prepare to be a hearer of God's word ready to receive? What have you found helps you prepare to be a hearer ready to receive the word of God? So use the box, please uh, comment, and we're going to come back to these in a few moments. And while you type out your responses, let me share a few thoughts as to the benefits of being a biblical listener. And I came across these in a book I was reading by Pastor Annie Abwile. Um, he is a pastor in uh, Turks and uh, and it was at the Turks Islands, and uh, he has spent a lot of time um, connected with Mark Dever in uh, helping navigate these nine marks of a healthy church, and he has actually written a book called Nine Marks of a Healthy Church Member. And in this, he lists some benefits of being a biblical listener, and these are what they are. It helps us first to cultivate a hunger for God's Word. When we come ready to hear God's Word, when we come expecting to hear God's word, when we come knowing that we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to hear God's word, guess what usually happens? We hear God's word. Um, And and we ought to come with this attitude of of desiring to to take in what God wants to, um, to instruct us in from the truth of his word, no matter who the communicator is. And as we come prepared to hear God's word, uh, to expect God's word, knowing that we're empowered by God's spirit, um, this should create in us a growing hunger that when we interact with God's word, God through his spirit will interact with us. Isn't that what we're all longing for? No one wants to sit through a sermon where you walk away going, God didn't speak to me. Every time we open up God's word, every time we sit through a study, every time I think we have a communication with another fellow brother and sister and and, and talk about God's word, um, our desire is we don't want to leave the same, but we want to leave changed. Well, we need to do that. In, In order to do that, we need to make sure that we are preparing ourselves to be a biblical listener. And the more we do that, the more it will cultivate in us a hunger and an expectation to hear the word of God. Second thing is this, it it takes the focus off the preacher. Um, When we prepare ourselves to be a biblical listener, it takes the focus off the preacher. The proclamation of God's word is not about the preacher, but about God. 
If we are looking to be entertained each week, we will often be left disappointed. Either in we will not be entertained, or that in the message that was presented, it might entertain us for the time, but it will mean that when we walk away, there was nothing um, in it, there was no meat involved in it that really caused any change in our heart. And so we need to make sure that we become focused uh, on hearing God's word. And if we do that, we will never be left disappointed. I'll tell you, when I look back on all the sermons that I have preached over 20 years of ministry, um, there's one thing that I've noticed. When I've preached a sermon that I walked away and felt it was amazing, uh, that I did a great job, I didn't mess up, um, that I said what I wanted to say, often I will find that the message fell on deaf ears. Yet the sermons that I walked away from maybe discouraged, um, the ones that I walked away from saying it didn't flow the way I wanted it to flow, and I prayed that God would use the inadequacy of my words to change a heart, it seems those sermons were where I was really the faulty vessel is that God really seems to come through and touch lives. And so I just encourage us um, to make sure that we're coming to hear not from a preacher or a teacher, that we're coming prepared to hear from God. And the final one I want to mention is this. When we come and we um, train ourselves to be a biblical listener, the third thing it does is it protects us and our church from corruption. If your focus is on hearing the word of God, um, then you'll be less likely to be swindled by the cunning words of false, of false teachers or, or even our own agendas in wanting to hear what we want to hear. I would encourage you to check every sermon or lesson you hear against the word of God. Don't take what I say for granted. Don't take it as truth. But I would encourage you to take time to, to look at the verses that we talk about. To have a good study Bible that you can pour into. And to check what I say or check what other teachers say against Scripture. Um, if you do that, then you will be less likely to fall prey to false teaching. So let's jump back to the questions about preparing um, our hearts to uh, to be here uh, to hears of God's word. And I'm just going to go through a couple of these, and uh, and then we will conclude. Uh, Chrissy says that uh, one of the ways is is taking a few quiet moments before the service. I can't tell you how important that is, especially when we were important. So many of us just kind of rush in um, to the service. Many rush into the service as the, maybe the first song is going. And that doesn't provide us a quiet time to reflect, to prepare our hearts, um, to ask God's spirit to, to quiet our thinking, to remove the distractions. And so I would hardly agree with that. Um, Sam says take time uh, in worship to still all the noise and distractions, definitely. We're, when we sing, the, the, the purpose of our worship songs, of reading scripture um, before the sermon, is to help us to focus, is to help us to remove the distractions, to focus our heart on God, and to prepare our hearts to receive what, what God wants to hear. Um, guidance through the Bible, um, so prayer is what Tamara shared. Uh, be early for the service, we kind of mentioned that. Um, create good habits of knowing God's word and being able to listen. Again, um, this is something that we have to build. It's a habit. It, it's a skill. Um, and uh, yes, Janet, I will cite the book afterwards. Um, also, Mike says, you know, we need to come and expect that God's going to speak to us during the service or a study. Um, Specifically asking the question, what is God trying to reveal, correct, or challenge in me? Yeah, instead of looking to the person beside you or the person across the aisle, um, what an incredible picture 
to go into any time of instruction and ask the question, what is God trying to reveal, correct, or challenge in me? And then Emma um, says, make sure that you take notes. And so as I sum these up, um, thank you, because you, um, you, you pulled out all the ones I summed up, and I, I had said the same thing. I said, begin with a, quiet, with a time to quiet your heart uh, to hear God's word. And a great way to do this is make sure that you are early to a service or um, have a quiet time, a quiet place, and to start by praying that God would speak to you. Um, I also have your Bible open, a pen ready, and somewhere to take notes so that you can remember what was said as well as take some time throughout the week to test what was said. Uh, to do this, uh, I would encourage you to invest again in a good study Bible so that you will have a trusted reference to go back and, and to test what anybody says as they teach or instruct you. Um, remove the distractions. This is made even harder when we're viewing church online. But I would suggest putting your phone away to start, unless that happens to be your Bible app and it's open, but it's the only thing that's allowed to be open. And do your best to join us at 1030 when we are together, rather than trying to watch at your leisure. This is a way that we can hold one another accountable. And then probably the most important of all, is to set aside time daily to be in God's word. Commit to be, ter to be nourished daily the, rather than just trying to stuff yourself on Sunday morning through someone else's teaching. Uh, we need to learn not just to be those that we can receive a hearty meal of God's word, but we also need to be a people that are in the habit of being able to prepare our own meals and making sure that we take time throughout the week to be involved in God's word, immersed in God's word, immersed in prayer. And the more we do that, I can guarantee you the more that we will come prepared, uh, excited to receive what God would have to say to us when we're together corporately. So committed to the biblical proclamation and to biblical teaching as well as biblical listening. Let's just pray, pray as we close. Father, we do thank you for this morning. And when we look at all the things that we could do or could mark us as a healthy church, um, Lord, my prayer is that at everything's foundation, our very foundation would be that we are a church that proclaims um, the truth of the word of God. That every time that we have an opportunity to, to teach, to instruct another person, whether that be corporately, a small group, a Sunday school class, maybe even someone one-on-one -on -one or someone that we're sharing the gospel. Lord, help us to be a, a people that proclaim not our ideas, not our thoughts, not our spin on things, but we are a people that are committed to to proclaiming the truth found in the word of God. And, uh, and Father, we pray that as we do that, Lord, um, that your Holy Spirit would transform lives. And on the flip side of that, Lord, we pray that you would help us to be biblical listeners, that we wouldn't seek to walk in to be entertained, to be wowed by stories, to be persuaded through, um, through human words, but Lord, that our focus would be in, in learning and hearing God's word unpacked for us. That again, your spirit would, would allow us to hear truth. And it would allow us to decipher what is truth and, and maybe what is not. And, uh, and so Father, we just, we just thank you that we as a church, throughout our 50 somewhat year history have been committed to be proclaim uh, to proclaim the, the the word of God and we pray Lord that this would continue to be our foundational um, mark our foundational commitment in the days moving forward that we would seek every opportunity like Paul said in season and out of season uh, to proclaim the word of God to anyone that would listen 
And so, Father, we pray, Lord, that as we work through the next number of weeks, um, Lord, that you would help us to, um, to understand what our role is, to understand what ought to mark us, and if there are things that need to change, Lord, that you would give us the courage um, to make those changes so that we can be a healthy church as we move on to fulfill um, your calling for us in our region. And so, Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for everyone that joined us. And we pray, Lord, that you would give us a great week in which we're able to be your hands and feet to the world around us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless everyone. Um, hope that you have a great week. And uh, and again, make sure that you uh, join us next uh, Sunday for our time in being able to... Uh, to, to hear Emma lead some worship, to, to be able to have her lead us, to also hear a little bit about her story, and, uh, and just pray that you would be praying for the process um, as we move into these last few stages. Um, but God bless, and just pray that you have a great week. We'll see everyone uh, next Sunday. Amen.